This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ronald Boud, who is a Professor Emeritus of Radiology at the University of Michigan. Uh, his numismatic interests lie in ancient and Anglo-Saxon coinage. And the title of his long table presentation is Don't Be Afraid of Technology, Using Sophisticated Techniques to Evaluate Ancient Coins. Uh, and related to that, um, for those of you who subscribe to our premier journal, the American Journal of Numismatics, uh, he has an article uh, in the last issue, the 2021 issue, that is co-authored with Aaron Bigelow, uh, entitled Non-Invasive Detection Cut and Shut Ancient Coin Forgery uh, Using Microcomputed Tomography. Uh, and maybe we'll hear a little bit about that research in today's presentation as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ron. Well, just a touch about myself. I am a professor emeritus. That just means that I got really old, but I still want to work a little bit. So I still work a little bit at my old job. Uh, and I usually try to give my university logo uh, to start the talk. And about 25 years ago, I was in England presenting a paper at a conference. And I proudly was going to, I was going to proudly present my logo because the University of Michigan was incorporated in 1817. I thought that's pretty cool. Well, the speaker ahead of me came up with this slide, uh, and there was no way I could compete with 1209, so I, I got away from my cover slide as quickly as I could because I felt like an idiot after this guy had his slide. Okay, I would like to thank my research assistant. Any of you who is owned by one of these knows that they like to get on your computer keyboard and Pootsie, which is my daughter's name for him, uh, uh, does the same. Okay, some background. You guys, probably all of you know this by now, you may, most of you had CT scans, but the image on the left is a, a typical advertisement image from whatever corporation this is, uh, advertising their latest, greatest human CT scanner, and they can be quite expensive, up to $3 million or so. In some of my investigations, I've used a micro CT scanner, which is just an itty bitty version of a human scanner. And that's actually the little portal for things to go in because they're, the most micro CT scanners are very restrictive. You can only put something about four centimeters in diameter, maybe up to about a foot long in them. And instead of the tube rotating around the patient like it does in a human scanner, the sample rotates in the micro CT, but the micro CT can take really thin, super neat slices. And again, just for illustration, CT scanning, if, uh, upper left-hand picture, that's a schematic of a body. And a CT scan is typically obtained what we call axially or transverse section, like the illustration shows and pretty analogous to uh, looking at the surface of a slice of bread if you remove it from a loaf. And human CT scans, when I first did CT back in the Neanderthal radiology days, would take a scan every one centimeter. Uh, now we can do scans of micro CT that are 10 microns thick, which is 100 times thinner than a one centimeter scan. That becomes helpful for us. Just as illustration, the uh, picture on the left is, is a CT scan uh, of a human showing those white things. Sorry, my eye itches. Those white things are the kidneys. And just for interest, that happens to be a kidney cancer. Uh, on the right is a coffee bean on the micro CT scanner, just showing the level of detail one can get with, with these newer devices that make incredibly thin sections. So as just a little principle, if you do enough scans of a human, whoops, actually, I, I can't use my mouse. This computer doesn't use a mouse. I'm using page up and page down, and sometimes it's finicky, sorry. At any rate, if you take thin enough slices of a human axiom, you are cutting like a loaf of bread, you can then digitally in the computer, if you wish, reconstruct them in other planes. So this is a slice from top to bottom, right side, left side. This is a, a, a lateral slice through the body. So we use this in uh, micro CT evaluation of artifacts and coins. Okay, now before coins, a little bit of stuff I've done just because I think it's neat and I needed something to fill up 45 minutes. 
So uh, anybody who has a CT scanner and has access to the technology and wants to do old things always scans mummies. And human mummies are just as passe as it could possibly be. So I managed to find a mummy that hadn't been scanned before at our Kelsey Museum at UM. This is a grain mummy uh, with the Egyptians because of the apparent magic to the Egyptians of a dead seed springing to life. It was thought to have perhaps similar properties for humans. So these were at times buried with, with uh, or entombed with mummies to help the mummy reassume life, I guess. At any rate, what a grain mummy is, is they would, uh, this lengthwise CT slice shows a gap in the middle. It's made of two halves, lengthwise halves that uh, were, you can see the wrappings right here. They, they were mud in which that was moistened and in which seeds were planted. And then once there had been germination, the two halves were put together after they were dried and were encased and made in a nice little mummy inside of its wooden coffin. Well, this is a surface reconstruction using CT. So we're seeing the rough outlines of the outside edge of the mud and seeds inside the wrapping. And what I think is cute is, is that since this top surface was flopped over to make the mummy, this was the top of, the, of this surface and this was the top of that surface. You can see the individual voids for the seeds with the sprouts going to the surface. And then this is a, a lengthwise, I mean axial section, section in this plane, you can see the actual dried vegetable matter that still remains from those sprouted seeds. Okay, uh, what got me interested in using my toys, because I call CT scanning and ultrasound toys and the electron microscope as a toy also. Uh, so about 15 years ago, I purchased a rare cuneiform tablet, not rare for its meaning, but rare because it was an enveloped one. Whoops, most of the tablets we see today have been opened already, but when made, many of them had the tablet which was incised with a message and then a thin layer of clay was put around it and another message that was put on top. Uh, often the same message to, uh, for somehow, some reason, the ancients thought that this was a method of message security to have the same message inside the tablet that had the same message on the outside, but, but was unbroken. At any rate, I got a translation of this uh, from Renee Kovacs, who is the wife of a, uh, a, certainly a former ancient coin dealer, if, if not still a current coin coin dealer. And I just think it's really cool. It, it's, it's a grain transaction. Most of these are transactions often grain, but this particular tablet, uh, when the message was translated, was of this guy in Larsa, who is about 50 to 100 miles away from Abraham. So this is a tablet issued during the lifetime of the biblical uh, patriarch Abraham, which, which is greatly interesting to me. And it may, Abraham probably knew about Sumu L. So I think that's pretty cool. But anyway, so I took this, I did a bunch of really thin CT scans across it axially. And this is not a clip because I don't trust clips on PowerPoint, but this is 30 images, which I'll go through quickly. What we did was we, as we get swing around to the front, you'll see an edge here. So this is the air gap between the inside tablet and we removed most of the outside part of the envelope. So what we're actually seeing inside here now is a surface reconstruction of the inside of the tabulate. And um, I, oops, sorry. I, I uh, contacted, looked around my university and found a guy who said he could translate this. And although he had some difficulty because there is a little degradation and he said, it's just different looking at this than looking at a tablet in hand. Uh, he was able to translate most of the message, which said what it said on the outside. And I thanked him for being, for using his Assyriology knowledge, at which point he rather indignantly said, I am a Hittitologist. So at any rate, a Hittitologist could translate this, but uh, that's what these tablets, so that's a demonstration of technology. So all about five or eight years ago, a fines officer in England contacted me with this uh, small silver votive ring. And it's only about a centimeter from side to side. It's a tiny little thing, 
But he said, I think this has been repurposed. I think there was an original surface that they've covered over with another silver layer. And I figured, oh, okay, that looks like some low hanging fruit, meaning pretty easy to study and publish. I haven't published it yet, but at least study. So I micro CT'd it, reconstructed slices in another plane. And this is an illustrative thin slice through the surface of it. Obviously it's not very contrasty. I'm gonna improve it for you. But uh, the surface was slightly beveled or angled. So any one thin slice couldn't show everything optimally. So the top pictures are a, each individual letter optimized, but the contrast wasn't changed too much. But that's what the ring would have looked like inside under the silver layer. And the bottom is uh, some digitally enhanced images of that surface. And this is what it would look like if it were stamped in clay. So this is the real message. And uh, I've asked Don Squires about what this means before. I don't read Greek, so this looks like Atmau to me, but it's some sort of combination of six, five Greek letters, but it's apparently not a word. So this meant something to somebody, but unfortunately doesn't mean anything to me. But at any rate, it, I thought it was pretty fun to study this. And as I've studied ancient, ancient coins, I have two travel buddies, uh, Lars Ramsgold and Brent Upchurch. We've been to virtually all the major cabinets in Europe and studied their ancient collections, including the Hermitage at St. Petersburg. So this is Ljubljana, Slovenia. This is Zagreb, Croatia. This is, uh, I believe that's, yeah, this is Paris and this is St. Petersburg. Uh, when I go visit foreign countries, I like to eat them. And as anybody who knows me very well knows, if I have to be granted the last meal, it's going to be donuts. Okay, now on to coins. This is the, the coin that Dr. Elkins was, was speaking about, or the paper that I did for the ANS. It was act, the definitive image from studying this coin was actually the poster image for this talk. This was a coin, a sh coin should be in, in uh, quotation marks, which I naively bought, and in my ignorance, failed to realize it was a forgery. Uh, during the early Tetrarchy, before the Numus or Phallus became the prevalent uh, bronze coinage, there were some much less common coins issued, uh, Cistercii, they're called, things like that. And this was sold as a possible ancient metal or Cistercius. And although the detail is not great, if you know the coinage, this is a, a coin of uh, Galerius as AUG, as Augustus, and of Constantius I as Caius Caesar. Caesar. Well, this coin is an impossibility because they were both raised from Caesar to Augustus at the same time. So I should have noticed that, that uh, error and thought there's no way this is real, but I didn't, nor did the major firm who auctioned it notice it. So they auctioned it and I bought it. And then I took it to a gentleman who does much of the uh, coin cleaning for bronze or for follies and numi for cng and i asked him because i met him at at the, the the coin show at the paris bourse many times and i asked him to clean it and he looked at it and said that's a cut and shut uh well okay i wasn't too hard to figure out what that meant but a cut and shut is where you take two coins two obverses in this case you slice the coin, each coin right down the middle or grind down the reverse half and you glue them back together again. And I thought, okay, well, this should be fun to study. So I did micro CT of that. And this is what we found. It's obviously a fake. You're, it's, you can easily see the two halves. You can see the intervening glue or whatever. And you can see the bullet up stuff on the edges, which is the reason for this, what I should have noticed as being rather fake looking edge of an ancient coin. So this was a cut and shut. A regular x-ray would have been extremely confusing, would not have shown any of this detail very well and probably wouldn't been able to have shown that it was a cut and shut. But it's another interesting example of uh, the use of micro CT and to we human radiologists, or well, I'm human, but we radiologists who study humans, uh, metal is, is, is bad for human CT scans, all such artifact. We, have, we can't penetrate it well, but in micro CT, the factors can be altered so we can go through metal. So that led me to wonder, 
can detail be resurrected from ancient coins as one thought lost? I thought micro CT might be pretty good for that. And it was. But anyway, okay. So here's a spectrum of condition of ancient coins uh, from left to right, top to bottom. This, this is the coin of Constantine the first. It's a very rare coin, uh, uh, very rare, uh, minted in uh, Lugdunum, Roman Lugdunum, which is modern day Lyon, France. And this is basically how you almost never find a bronze coins if it's excavated, because they always corrode. And uh, they often look more like this. This is a coin from the Rouseby hoard found in England several years ago. I managed to know one of the two finders and uh, they declared the hoard. It was uh, the British Museum took a couple samples that they didn't have, returned the rest and disclaimed it as they call it. So the hoard then went back to the finders. The landowner got half, each finder got a quarter. And I was able to cherry pick what he had from that hoard. And uh, although it's hard to tell, this is one of the fairly rare LON mint marked uh, London Numi. Uh, fewer than 100 are known to exist. Uh, and this is actually in extremely good condition because coins from this hoard, if mechanically cleaned or very carefully chemically cleaned, can be very high grade on the order of this guy. But this is what we want to buy. This is how they're usually found, but at least this can turn into something. Then we have further degrees of degradation. This is what's, what's called a crusty. This is how uh, not too good Roman coin, bronze coin may be found. You can see that there is some surface in there. It's covered a bunch of dirt, all sorts of corrosion, which if it's pretty corrosion is called patina, although that's probably been chemically cleaned, or probably been artificially patinated at any rate. But there might be enough information in this coin to be able to tell what it is. And in the archeological setting, uh, they can sometimes do some pretty definitive dating of, uh, of their dig area from the, uh, the timing of the ancient coin. But this might be a bear to clean and to be able to identify and attempts to clean it if it's quite corroded, may actually destroy it, you may never know. But at least, there turned out to be some metal in this coin. These five coins, uh, there's no metal in them. This is a scrape of the corrosion that is smooth that makes it look glossy like metal, but there's no metal in any of these coins proven by CT. They're basically all corrosion. And it would probably be exceptionally difficult, if not impossible, to do much definitive work on those to resurrect enough detail to be able to tell exactly what uh, who the ruler was when they were issued. I, I thought that at least in some of those guys, if they were all corrosion, there would at least be a higher concentration of copper and silver where there was originally copper and silver rather than on the covering corrosion where there wasn't originally metal. So I thought micro CT might be able to see that. And of course, if they're corroded enough to go to dust and you can't do anything with it. But at any rate, so to again, uh, illustrate, I did micro CT on these with 10 micron or 100 slices per millimeter CT slices. And I scanned the coin. I keep hitting my touchpad and it makes it go back. Uh, okay, I'll be careful. Okay, so again, the coins were scanned perpendicularly to their faces. And then in the computer, we reconstructed them in a not perpendicular plane, but in one uh, uh, a plane parallel with the face of the coin. And for that coin that probably had some detail in it, there was indeed metal inside. And by doing slices at slightly different levels, because being 10 microns, you might hit the detail on this side, but this side's, but this side's not in focus, not at the slice level. We used multiple slices. And uh, for the obverse, if you know ancient coins, you can figure out who it is, the reverse gave a nice picture. This is not that coin, but this is the type of coin, a coin of Valentinian. So that would have been roughly like 375 AD, something like that. So the technology works when there's still metal left, but what about if there's no metal? So this is a, a schematic, a, a cross section of that coin that I just showed you, roughly showing that there's dirt, there's corrosion or patina and metal. And we can resurrect the detail from something like that. 
but this is what I wanted if we could surface this, we could evaluate. It's the same schematic, but I turned the inside orange green. So there'd be dirt and corrosion and that's it. So took these coins, no metal inside, minimal detail, micro CT slices. I reconstructed them like I showed you the cake. And on this partially broken coin here, three different slices, slightly different levels in the coin, disclose enough legend for me to be able to identify it. I'll show you the type of coin in a second. To the reverse, now in retrospect on the reverse, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a, a, a standard, there's a standing figure. Maybe I could have did, figured out for sure who that was, but with micro CT, I can know definitely this is uh, F-E-L-I-C, and there's a hidden I and then TA, this is flicka, Flickitas. And so enough detail from that for me to know this is a coin of Valerian, 253 to 260 AD, RIC 87. Uh, so no metal left, probably not of any use to an archeologist, but at least in this coin, we could tell what it was. Another coin, Again, in retrospect, I can see the crested helmet here, a bit of a face, uh, not much on the reverse, but again, at one slice, I can see the helmet and the crest. That's enough alone for you to know it's an Herb Roma commemorative, Constantinopolitan, Constantinopolitan 330 to 335 AD approximately. But the reverse is really cool, all corrosion, but we can still see the wolf and twins from the foundation myth of Rome. So we knew that, that this was that coin. So this coin, if in the appropriate context, would indicate a date of about 330, 335. The other three coins had no discernible details. So it's not always possible to resurrect detail from totally corroded coins, but it is at least possible. And uh, anybody's got any coins they wanna know, let me know on micro CT and we can do another study like that. So summary, micro CT possesses the capability to, to investigate metal items, first off, as long as they're not really thick, and can resurrect detail from ancient coins, perhaps thought once not uh, retainable. So is it interesting for collectors? No, nobody's going to want to collect those grots or those crusties that I just showed but it has potential uses for archaeology if they can access micro CT. And those units are around. They're not, they're not rare, but they're not common either. So uh, I now move to compositional analysis of ancient silver copper alloy coins. And I'm sorry, there is going to be a little science here, a couple busy slides. I'll try to uh, be kind. Uh, if you try to analyze ancient silver copper alloy coins, they're a different kind of animal. Uh, they're not like US coins. US coins are rarely collectible and found very corroded. And silver copper alloys, when they are made, do funny things. This is why it's difficult. If you take a molten silver copper mixture, you put copper and, and silver together and melt it and then make cool it and make flans, uh, it's rarely homogeneous inside. There's a different amount of silver on the surface than there is inside. Uh, that's just naturally. Uh, corrosion will change the concentration of silver on the surface compared to the inside. And man can intervene and be deceptive and do the same thing. And at that deception, the Romans were, were absolute masters of empirical archeology, span um, empirical metallurgy, being able to do this. So silver copper alloys versus the world and man. Okay, as I said before, complex phenomenon. Now these ancient coins also contain usually small amounts of lead and tin. Those elements do not influence the argument here or influence my results. So I'm not gonna talk about lead and tin anymore. But as I said before, this concentration of silver on the surface can be altered either by a natural phenomenon called segregation or what you may have heard called surface silver enrichment, which will be due to either corrosion or deceptive manipulation by humans. So here's a little bit of metallurgy, please bear with me. The only mixture of silver and copper that when made molten and allowed to cool 
which will give the same concentration of silver and copper anywhere within the bulk of that coin is 72% silver and 28% copper. The metallurgic term for that is the eutectic. You don't need to remember that, but it does have a special term because lots of different combinations of metals have varying degrees of solubility. And although though the word solubility seems to be rather uh, inappropriate for a solid uh, like a metal, it's still talked about as solubility. So at 72% silver, 20% copper, they are multi mutually soluble in each other, just like pouring water and alcohol and everything is fine. Any other mixture gives an homogeneity. Okay, a discussion of segregation. This happens normally when a silver copper alloy cools. And if the copper concentration, if the silver concentration is anywhere from about 15 to 20% at the low point and 72% at the high point, so anywhere in that range, when it solidifies, it's pretty much got the same concentration of silver at the surface, the eutectic, okay, about 72% or close to it. And a 72% silver copper alloy in hand, as far as we're concerned by eye, is going to look the same as, as, as a pure silver or a 95% silver coin. So the Romans knew about this. So this graph down here, this depicts what the Romans did to their currency, they, inf they inflated their currency, just like we inflate it today. We just inflate it differently. About at the time of Nero, denarii about 95% silver, 5% copper. And with, with variations, because emperors, Trajan, uh, other people tried to improve the silver coins. And basically, the trend of this is, is like a stock market graph you never want to see. Uh, it's just a continual debasement because Roman emperors, as well as American Congress and presidents, always want to spend more money than they have. So how do they spend more money? They make more of it by putting less silver in it. And so over the span of about 200 years, the Romans went from 95% silver in their silver coins to about 5% or even less in their so-called silver coins. But they could make them look silver. Now, this segregation would happen down to about, oh, say the, the, uh, the uh, Antoniniani of Valerian, about 250 AD, posthumous, somewhere around that area. Lower than that, even naturally produced silver alloys would not look silvery. The populace would look and say, ah, this is coppery look, and this is not a good silver coin. But as I said, the Romans were amazing empirical metallurgists. So, what happens with corrosion in the ground is the same thing that happens when the Romans did it intentionally. This is a schematic of a coin that's not got much silver in it. And the white areas are higher silver, yeah, higher silver concentration, and the dark areas are higher copper concentration. Now, in a micrograph of a coin, those areas aren't elliptical or spherical. They're rhomboidal, square, rectangular. They've got angular shapes to them, but there are definite areas that are high in silver and definite areas that are high in copper. And the lower the silver goes, the more you've got a bunch of these guys around. And when they congregate at the surface, like they would with a Roman ant of 5% silver or a numus or a phallus, it's not going to look silvered. It's speculated, although not completely proven, that the Romans were able to artificially enhance the silver in the surface by taking the coin flans, putting them in acid, and they had plenty of acid. That the tartaric acid is one speculated that they use, and that's the crystalline material that can form at the bottom of wine bottles. So they had abundant tartaric acid available. It's thought that they might have put them in an acid, and copper is able to be oxidated much, oxidized much more easily than silver. So if you put a coin in acid with that's mostly copper, the copper is going to leave, but the silver is pretty much going to stay. So if they did that, they would have a silvery surface that was porous. And if they struck it, they would compact it. So they get a nice silvery surface. So that's, it's definite that they were able to do this. It's speculated, but not completely proven that it was done using acid. But at any rate, they could make pretty cool looking coins that were silver to start, but had hardly any silver in them. Same thing happens with corrosion from the acids in the ground, but that's obviously not intentional. 
Uh, I digress, it's got nothing to my metallurgy, but I love this. Uh, Henry VIII was betrayed by, by, the, by his debasement of his coins. Uh, later in his reign, he severely debased the silver content to, uh, I think it's less than 32%. And uh, English coins bef much before that were sterling silver or better, I think. But he debased them. When issued, they looked nice and silvery on the surface. As they wore away, though, they began to get a coppery color. And he acquired the nickname Old Copper Nose uh, because of suspicious pe people who didn't like what he did to the coins, but they're stuck with it. And the nose being the high point would go coppery first. Okay, but now, so how do we analyze these things if you've got that funny surface, it's more silver than it ought to be. Uh, and I will state there is no accessible accurate method to non-invasively evaluate the composition, composition of ancient Roman silver alloy coins that are much less than pure silver because of those surface phenomena. You folks may have heard of what we call XRF or X-ray fluorescence. That's where you take a X-ray gun and bombard a coin with X-rays and X-ray knocks out a lower lower orbital electron and a higher orbital electron plops down to fill the void and in doing so loses energy and gives off an x-ray photon. So you put x-rays in, you get dif different x-rays back. And those x-rays are characteristic of the elements inside in their energies. Trouble is this method at most will penetrate 100 microns and often only 10 or 20. So XRF only gives you a surface analysis, which is gonna be totally wrong on most Roman silver alloy coins much after the end of the first century. Uh, I've used energy dispersive spectroscopy, we call it EDS. Uh, it's basically using an electron microscope, do the same thing, but you bombard the metal with electrons instead of x-rays, but you knock, you knock electrons off, x-rays come back and analyze them. But this is as surface dependent as XRF, only a max of 100 microns deep. So they don't work for what uh, most what I want to do. Now, there are two techniques that will give you accurate analyses of the internal metal. You can do neutron activation analysis. Good luck with getting that done. You usually need a nuclear reactor. And if you study a coin with silver in it, it's rendered radioactive enough that it's got to be put in a nuclear depository for at least five years before you can get it back. And it costs a lot anyway. There's the more recent muon analysis, which the ANS had a talk on, not in this series, but in another series. And this will also do a bulk analysis. Uh, it doesn't make the coins radioactive. A muon is basically, it's a subatomic particle and is uh, basically an electron on steroids. It can go right through the coin and you can analyze the inside of a coin with this, with muons, but it's available at a couple of places. I applied for a grant to study 40 Edbert coins at a facility in England. My grant was refused the first time, but they encouraged me to resubmit. So I still hope maybe I could do it. But anyway, I submitted a grant. I needed two weeks of bean time for that. And after I submitted my grant, I realized that I was requesting for the equivalent of 200,000 pounds worth of, of, of uh, free analysis. So. I've got to try and figure a way to pare down my request and my resubmission. But at any rate, those two will do it, but good luck on getting them and you won't afford them anyway. Now, there are other ways to do bulk analyses. COPE in the early 70s analyzed more than a thousand uh, low grade Roman silver copper alloy coins by dissolving them in aqua regia acid and then chemically analyzing them. Anybody that had quantitative chemistry in college or high school, I know it's very laborious with lots of solutions and drying and weighing. It's terrible to do, but we're not going to do that now. He used low-grade coins, but for the coins I want to study, I can't analyze enough that way. Uh, Matthew Ponting in England also has a way. This illustrates his way. He takes a tiny drill and drills into the coin discards the superficial metal that's not the right composition and analyzes the internal metal. That's not entirely accurate either, but it's much better than anything else that's not non-invasive. But I'm not gonna even do that to my ancient coins, nor do I think you would want to either. So that's out. Now, 
I analyzed some coins I'll briefly talk about now. And I, I used the electron microscope in a little bit different way. I ruined the coins too. You don't want to use it, but I had to. So what did I do? This is my other research interest besides using CT and other toys to evaluate ancient coins. This is the Saxon coinage of Eadbert, king of Northumbria, centered on York for about 20 years in the early to mid 700 AD. Uh, they're small coins, about 13 millimeters away, about a gram. And these are just four of many varieties, the sub varieties. There's probably 50 or 60 sub varieties in total of this coinage. And it's thought that he probably debased his coinage over time during his reign, because after him, the coins are more debased than they were at the beginning of probably the beginning of his reign. Uh, but I can't, I can't study 60 sub varieties, which would require multiple varieties, multiple examples of each one. I'm not going to dissolve all those in acid, but I could at least prove previous research wrong. So a while ago, Metcalf, who's like considered the grandfather of, of English chats or skeets, or the coins of the Anglo-Saxons approximately 700 to 800 AD, he used surface techniques and analyzed a bunch of coins and said, oh yeah, when they started out, they were six, seven silver, and then they were five, seven silver, and then oh, sometime they were two thirds or one half silver. Well, I proved that, well, it's negative research. I proved everything he did was wrong, but people kind of suspected that because he used surface techniques, but they didn't know for sure. So he used surface techniques. I got these six victims. Uh, these are poor condition or broken coins. And I want to know the true metallurgy of these guys, but I couldn't use a uh, muon or neutron. So I cut them open, cut them in half, polished them. And then I evaluated them with the electron microscope metallurgically. And we can just see by looking at them that there's obviously different concentrations of silver at the surface than there is in the inside. This is a more brassy example. This is a more bronzy, yeah, bronzy example. I, the Saxons, I don't think were too particular about whether it was bronze or brass, as long as they got some silver in there. But at any rate, you can, I can just tell by looking at this that there's difference between the center and the outside. This is an electron micrograph example of a couple. And if you look closely, we can actually distinguish one, two, three, four different layers in there. So there are four different zones of, of silver concentration, uh, probably representing a combination of segregation happening normally, corrosion happening normally, and surface enhancement by treating these guys, again, to falsely make the silver look surface look more silvery. So I then was able to do what I call EDS or determine the surface analysis with electron microscope and each little rectangle is an area that I measured. So I measured the concentration of silver from the surface fully into the bulk, bulk metal in the inside. And uh, this, this is an optical photograph of this particular coin. And this is a compositional graph scale to match this coin. So we can see at the surface is about 60% silver goes up to about 70% about this far in. But when you get in the middle, it's about 45, 48%. So surface analyses would have given somewhere in the low 60s, but it's really in the mid to upper 40s. And if you're trying to make a point about debasement of currency, that's a large enough difference to be very significant. This is another even more florid example. Uh, this coin at the surface was 90% silver but quite quickly descended to about 60% in the coppery looking inside. So again, surface analysis of this would just be totally unreliable. So if I couldn't determine the metallurgy of these coins, I could at least prove that everything else that has been done is wrong and we need to start over, which is why I submitted a grant for muon analysis of these guys. So what did my study prove? I've already said it, I often get ahead of myself. All prior compositional analyses of this coinage are wrong, and we must start over. Uh, a summary again. So you can do accurate analyses, muon and neutron. Uh, some places can do them. A few studies have been published using them, but it's really hard to go to the whole of them, and you can't afford them. 
XRF and EDF, very limited. You can't use them unless you cut the coin open. And nobody anymore is going to want to cut them up totally or dissolve them in acid to do an analysis. Now, this is the penultimate slide I have. This has got nothing to do with compositional analysis. And I don't know how many of you folks are only uh, modern coin collectors. And of course, to a person who collects, to an ancient coin collector, not to an ancient coin collector, not an ancient coin collector, uh, there's a special fascination with the ancient guys because things happen with these guys that just aren't in, don't happen with modern coins and modern's probably anywhere from 1700 on. And that is there's substantial history that can be associated with these guys. Not only just the history in holding them and, and marveling at the fact that you're holding a, an Athenian tetradrachm of 2,400 years old and wondering whether it was spent for a cow or a prostitute or whatever. Uh, these are two coins from the Boscorial hoard. And these are gold coins, and gold doesn't usually tarnish. These tarnished, and it, it's not the gold actually tarnished, it's the trace amounts of silver and copper in the alley which tarnished, but these have acquired a beautiful degree of toning, just like some of those NGC certified beautifully toned coins have. But this toning was acquired naturally because the Boscorial hoard was found near the town of Boscorial in Italy which was on the slopes of, slopes of Vesuvius. And these coins were buried in the Vesuvian eruption and conflagration. So those of us who collect ancient coins, and these examples now be on the range of 40,000 bucks a piece, uh, I someday, my retirement funds permitting and my wife allowing, I'm going to buy one of these Boscorial hoard coins because I want to hold a coin from the Pompeian destruction. My research assistant and I, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ron, for that great and great. informative presentation. Um, I wanted to start off uh, our question with one, our questions with one I have. Um, with the micro CT scanning, I, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of potential there for archeological investigation, I think. So for example, I work at this, um, excavation in Israel and uh, you know the the soil is very corrosive and a lot of the coins our conservator effectively refuses to clean because they'll disintegrate otherwise right uh, it, and um, so I'm wondering um, you know what is um, how how labor intensive is this kind of study how how expensive is it if you need to partner with the uh, a lab at a university or something, because obviously, you know, this kind of equipment's not something you would have in a, in our archaeological lab. So, so what are the costs and the labor involved in this kind of um, imaging? All right, uh, I can provide mostly an answer to that. It's going to be reflective of my own experience, not necessarily the experience at other places. Uh, one reason I asked to be Professor Meredith, besides wanting to work a little bit, was I wanted to maintain access to the fun toys I have for the university. And the Department of Orthopedics has a micro CT scanner that they use to evaluate the internal bone structure of Neanderthal femur hip joint areas to try and show how the stresses that the Neanderthals put on their femurs differed from what we put on our femurs today. Uh, so they have a micro CT scanner and a very good one. Uh, so my department won't pay for these studies. So I donate my own money to my self-funded research account. And I can therefore, if I use a research account at the U, I can get the research rate for their equipment. So for me to use the uh, micro, electron microscope, uh, Raman spectroscopy, micro CT, cost me $42 an hour of scan time. And one of these ancient coins I showed you, I think took about an hour to scan. So it's gonna cost me about $42. I made friends with one of the uh, grad associates who works in the orthopedics lab. And she's really thinks this is really cool. So she does image reconstruction for me for free. 
So as long as I don't inundate her, I can analyze an ancient coin for about $50 or so. Uh, and if you have some that you want to have analyzed, um, contact me. Uh, if you can get them to me, I'll analyze them. But that gives problems because people don't want to trans give their give their coins to undesirables. And for all you know, I'm an undesirable. Uh, but at any rate, if you, if you want being analyzed some, I'll do them because this is play. Uh, I enjoy doing it. And there are probably other things to discover that other people haven't thought about yet until you run into a problem with something and try to see what you ran into. If anybody else there has some issues like that you want solved, uh, please contact me. Let's see what we can do. I've never been an inundated with too many requests to fulfill research uh, proposal things. So I'm not worried that you guys are gonna flood me with topics, but uh, uh, if you can think of anything that micro CT might work with, or you have some problem corroded coins you want studied, uh, I'm sure Emma can give you my email address. Shoot me an email. Did Great. that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the problems with um, excavation coins in particular is, you know, they um, the countries uh, don't don't give the export licenses to, you know, right. ship out. So we've tried that with Israel before, and you know, so basically any work on them in Israel, they have to stay. So, so, you know, that's kind of a problem, but that's very, very helpful information. I wonder if maybe we could talk about uh, working with one of the universities in Israel on, on that and establish a budget. But yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, yeah. Any, any other questions for Ron? I, oh, I had one, if I may, yeah. Um, it's a sort of two or three part question, but I hope they're all quick. So the first one is, I love what you did with the sod coin. Um, I'll write to you and explain exactly what I have in mind. But sure, which which of, coin? I couldn't hear you. The which ones coin? that you were the ones that you sawed in half. The saw. In oh, half. <laughs> yeah, that's um, the Russian. I call excuse me. I call that the Russian method for the reason. Uh, back in the era of the Cold War, and the U.S. and the Russia had jets. The U.S. I've heard the U.S. very aerodynamically designed them and made the surfaces smooth and all sorts of analyses because they wanted to go as fast as possible. And I heard the Russian solution was, hmm, go faster, bigger engine, more fuel. And they had <laughs> bolts sticking out, everything, okay? So my method of analysis is more like the Russian method, but okay, sorry, go ahead. So what, was, what kind of a spot size do you have when you're scanning the sliced edge? A spot size, you mean when I showed the little rectangles, how big of an area I analyze yeah. each time? Yeah. I can make it whatever I want. I, I oh, can go great. from, I can go a, one micron by one micron up to uh, almost the whole surface of the coin. And in your main discussion, you were talking about how um, silver coins are, are debased by adding more copper. And you said you wanted to set the lead and the tin on the side. Um, do you have, does your device in fact actually measure things like lead and tin? Because what I'd be interested in is getting some of those uh, more smaller constituents. Right, and the answer to that is yes, with some provisos. The, the smaller the amount, the smaller the percentage number, the bigger the measurement error. So if yes. you, for instance, wanted me to tell you, is, uh, is there, what's the concentration of lead? I suspect it to be 1%. The error might also be about that big. So if you right. want to distinguish one, between 1% 1 and 1.5% lead, uh, I would probably have to analyze a massive amount of coins to get a statistically significant difference. Right. Um, and the final part of my three-part question, the, the, the coins that I have access to that are sawn in half, um, they're, they're mostly nominally silver, but they have obvious copper cores. Um, do you require any surface preparation other than the having been sawn and polished? Uh, Yes and no, they're polished, but it is other surface preparation. I, I, to get them smooth enough for an accurate analysis, I embed them in acrylic plastic, which can be moved. It doesn't damage the coins. Right. I embed them in acrylic plastic, uh, go to our mechanical engineering lab. They have polisher, polishing wheels there. And I squirt progressively smaller 
um, size diamond emulsions on there and polish them down to, I forget how, how small a diamond particle, but it's like 25 micron size diamond particles. So I would, I would have to polish it to mirror smoothness to our eye Mm. And using a fine enough diamond powder to be essentially mirror smooth to electron microscope too. Because if you don't polish them, if you have a, a regular surfaces, the beam, that's right, the beam scatters and you get a less accurate analysis. Right. All right. I, the rest of it's going to get very, very technical. So I'll have Emma send me your email. Well, I might not be able to answer it if you get a whole lot more technical, but I'll give it a shot. <laughs> All right. I look forward to working with you on this. I hope it'll work okay. out. Anybody else awake? Yeah, uh, Ron, I, I have a question. Um, it, it, is there any way to use specific gravity with a, um, a surface analysis technique like that several you demonstrated to come up with a plausible composition of the bulk um, uh, of the coin? I don't know, but I've wondered about it. That's on my future list of things to see if I can figure out. You would, it would have to, well, if it were a, if they were a totally bimetallic coin, surface-specific gravity is going to work. Uh, I've wondered if there, if there was say, a trimetallic composition, if you knew what the three metals were, if it would work. But to this point, Don, I don't know, but it's an area of interest. Thank you. Hi. Uh, um, can you hear me OK? Yeah. Yeah, hi, I want to thank you for a lovely talk. Um, your comment about, this is more of a comment than a question, but I just wanted to share it. Your comment about the Biscorial, and I, I love I love toning, um, reminds me of the Lockett collection. Um, Lockett, as many know, had one of the finest collections of both ancient as well as English coins. Mm -hmm. um, the story I was told was um, during the, so he, during the war, he kept his silver and copper coins at home, but to, because of the war, he put his gold coins in the bank so that they'd be protected. Yeah. During the Blitz, the bank was hit by a German bomb and it cooked. So mm -hmm. his coins survived, but the uh, locket coins have, a, have this nice, really <laughs> rosy red tone from cooking during the war as well. Uh I think that's neat. I also collect English coins. I've recently started to collect groats and up to up to the end of the hammered era. Uh, but and I have a one gold coin. It would now that you told me that it'd be mm -hmm. I think it'd be absolutely amazing to be able to own one of his uh, German yeah. roasted coins. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, the, the Ger I have one. The German coins, you actually have stuff. You have mint coins that are actually melted during uh, during bombing, so you can get. Um, they're kind of interesting. Um, one question I had is a little uh, askew, but um, one long outstanding question I've had with respect if it can be solved with coin analysis is there's an issue of Gordian. Uh, there's this gold issue of coins, which um, a horror came out, of, I guess maybe about a couple of decades ago that they're all mint state. And, um, you know, sort of, I have one of those coins as well as one with a 1950s provenance and sort of at, if like, is there a good way to do metal analysis to see are the new coins actually, do they match the, the metal of, of the, uh, of the issue that has a, a good provenance? That's also an interesting question to which I'll give an incomplete answer, unfortunately. Uh -huh. Surface enrichment that happens with silver copper coins should also happen with gold silver coins, but I don't know how badly that affects the alloy as happens with copper silver. In other words, gold and silver may be close enough on the EMF chart or potential to be oxidized that there might not be too much change, but there could be. Uh -huh. And I've I've not investigated gold coins, so I've mm -hmm. not read much about that. So yeah. I uh, can contribute a small point there. This isn't the full answer, but it depends a lot on how much chloride there is in the burial environment. Chlorine attacks silver quite aggressively. Mm -hmm. um, 
compared to let's say gold. So you're absolutely right um, to emphasize that the electronegativity of these guys is both very low and close to zero. And the gold will really not get leached. But but if there's enough chloride in the ground or in this burial at sea, you'll get quite a lot of um, etching out of the silver. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Looks like that's it. Thank you for very much talk. for listening, guys. Uh, thanks for your compliments. Uh, I'll take them with a grain of salt, but anyway, thank you. And. Uh, Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.